It's worth talking about the importance of trust in the commons and what it means for its feasible size. Historically, most commons have revolved around natural resources such as land, water, wild game, forest, fisheries, and so forth. Most of these tend to be fairly small, between several dozen people and 100 or 200 people. Why such limits on size? British anthropologist Robin Dunbar suggested that there is a cognitive limit to the number of people with whom we can have trusted, stable relationships. This is because our brain size, our neocortex, limits our ability to keep track of more than roughly 150 people, the so-called Dunbar number. That's about the maximum number, give or take a few dozen, that we're able to keep track of through our personal experience and to keep track of their reputations and to develop trusting relationships with people. Trust is an important factor in the commons because if you can't trust someone, he or she could very well become a free rider, taking more than their fair share of the resource than has been agreed to, or the person might abuse the resource or the community. When a commons works well, it's because everyone shares the same general social norms and management practices. And anyone who violates the rules or norms can be identified. Culture and social trust can be seen as efficient ways to enforce rules in a commons. Now, it's certainly possible to develop commons that have more than 150 or 200 participants, but that generally requires the invention of governance structures and more restrictive rules and certainly enforcement mechanisms. All of these require energy and complexity, but they do allow us to scale the size of a commons. You could say that government itself was invented to help us scale trust to larger sizes. But it's also worth noting that the internet has given us new tools to scale trust. You can have loosely trustworthy groups that number in the hundreds or even thousands of people, such as Wikipedia, or the open source computer operating system, Linux. At bottom, the critical issues involve the authentication of digital identity and the ability of a given community to establish reputations for people. So for example, on eBay, the online auction and market website, people often rate the quality of their transactions with sellers. This gives public feedback about people's trustworthiness or their speed in fulfilling orders. On Amazon, readers are invited to give short reviews of books, and TripAdvisor invites travelers to review hotels and restaurants. This is about reputation, which is a kind of signal that someone is trustworthy or not, and in specific, what specific ways. Now, these reputation systems on the internet are fairly crude and not always reliable, particularly because they can be gamed. They're also a bit unreliable because they're on open websites that don't really rely on authenticated identities of people. In this sense, they are not really commons. A real commons has identifiable members and defensible boundaries around the community so that you know who's in and who's out, and the community has the capacity to know who's violating the rules and to punish them. But open platforms don't really allow you to do this, at least not right now. I'm happy to say there are some new innovations in software design that are attempting to deal with the limitations of open platforms. Many of them are self-consciously applying uh, Eleanor Ostrom's design principles for successful commons to, to the design of the software platform itself. A prime example is Open Mustard Seed, a very new system for secure digital identity and the establishment of trust frameworks among groups of individuals, a kind of, sort of like a social contract that people enter into. The point to remember is that any successful commons needs systems to assure trust among its participants. That's why scale matters, and it's also why transparency and the capacity to sanction free riders and vandals is important. But notice, Ostrom observes that graduated sanctions work best because that helps punish those who violate the rules while maintaining the relationships. From this perspective, you can understand why social norms and culture are so important. They're incredibly efficient ways to assure trust within a commons. They're much cheaper and effective than, for example, lawsuits or regulation or police officers. There's also a lesson to be learned here about large-scale governance systems. They could well be less trustworthy because of their size. In large centralized institutions, 
power tends to be more concentrated and processes can be kept more secretive. This makes it easier and more attractive for free riders to try to corrupt the institutions. So when you think about how to design and implement successful commons, you must think about the mechanisms that will assure social trust and allow it to scale.